Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of Real History. Uh, I am history professor Jared Frederick, always pleased to have you join us for the next installment and I am really looking forward to the film that we're going to be looking at today. In this series we, we look at a lot of war films, we look at a lot of uh, films of very serious subject matter, and tonight we decided to do something a little bit different and take a more lighthearted approach about history that still nonetheless matters though. And it is the 1992 sports comedy, which is also a great historical film called A League of Their Own. Yes, there's no crying in baseball. That's what we're gonna take a look at tonight. Even though we could just kind of pass this off as a, a generic sports film, a beloved sports film, it in so many ways offers these rich historical insights of the American home front in the 1940s as World War II is ongoing. And it also, a lot of the themes in the movie, also reveal to us and forecast a lot of the social change that will be happening in America in the post-World War II era. We're going to be taking a look at all of these things as we watch A League of Their Own. So let's dive right in and see what the film has to offer. One of the important things to recognize about when A League of Their Own comes out in 1992 is that this was the 50th anniversary of the Second World War. Uh, those who had endured the war as adults were in uh, their 70s, perhaps their 80s by this point. There was a national commemoration that was ongoing for the semi-centennial. There was a lot of nostalgia for the 1940s, and rightfully so. Americans were looking back and considering, you know, the greatest generation, their contributions on both the battlefront and the home front. And certainly, a league of their own fits within that equation of uh, commemoration and historical memory. Um, an important little bit of context here, cinematically speaking. Now remember, no matter what your brother does, he's littler than you are. So give him a chance to shoot. Promise? A clever little bit of narrative overlap here is the fact that uh, Gina Davis's voice is actually dubbed over the actual voice of the older actress who is portraying her. And I think it works fairly well for the sake of continuity so audiences will later know who they're looking at. This is not the music that we typically associate with Hans Zimmer. <laughs> Another funny thing about Hans Zimmer is the fact that uh, apparently he didn't really know what baseball was or, or how it was played or how it worked. And so director Penny Marshall had to explain to him in depth uh, how the game worked uh, so he could hit the right cues, musically speaking, uh, to capture the right ambience and atmosphere. Kind of funny when you think about it. <laughs> On the sweatshirts of uh, our aged players here, uh, we see the abbreviation for the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Uh, that is what this league was called during the 1940s as World War II was ongoing. We'll get into more of the history of that as the story progresses. They won't come back till it's over, over there. With this archival footage right at the beginning, we gained some uh, some important historical insight uh, that was one of the rationales for prompting uh, the Girls Baseball League to begin with. And that was due to the fact that so many uh, athletes of military age who were males were enlisting in military service. Now, the film would have us believe that, you know, like both leagues just evaporated uh, during the war years because of this exodus. In reality, what a lot of ball clubs did is that they uh, pulled these second stringers from the minor leagues uh, to fill their ranks on a temporary basis. But nonetheless, uh, there was a need and a desire to propel the game, and this is when women stepped up to help fill that void. Some of these initial scenes with almost uh, a sandlot baseball type ambience uh, it really kind of speaks to the organic popularity of women's baseball and women's softball. 
Um, Time Magazine did an article in June of 1943 indicating that there were, in fact, hundreds of thousands of female baseball players who were playing at a local level, and there was a lot of popularity in these female ball clubs, uh, you know, with kind of a hometown flavor. And one reason why that was so is because Major League Baseball was somewhat inaccessible. Unless you lived in a big city, you very well may have never seen a big league game. Yeah, they were on the radio, but if you actually wanted to see a baseball game, these sort of hometown teams uh, really helped fit the bill. Gina Davis's character of Dottie is a composite of a number of real-life baseball players, um, but one character which she closely relates to is the real-life person of Dottie Green, who played for the real-life Rockford Peaches from 1943 to 1947, and she was considered by many to be one of the finest female baseball players in the United States. Um, and so for a fictionalized take on her, uh, Green seemed to be you know, uh, quite the suitable option. Daughter, Dottie's sister. Should have just had you and bought a dog. Prior to this film, hardly anybody knew about the, the All-American Girls League. And had director Penny Marshall not seen a television documentary, it was on PBS, I believe, that really sparked her interest, uh, she otherwise may not have been compelled to make this film. Um, and so, uh, who knows if, if these ladies would have ever gotten their due on the big screen uh, had it not been for a made-for-television documentary. Doesn't that hurt them? Doesn't seem to. That would bruise the hell out of me. <laughs> Professional baseball? Mm-hmm. They'll pay you $75 a week. Making $75 a week during the war to play baseball was a really good deal. On average, Americans only made about $30, $35 a week, and to make more than double that while a lot of the men were off fighting the war, um, that was a very appealing offer uh, being made here, just to kind of give us a sense in regard to inflation. Will you shut up? If she comes, you can come too. If you stink, it'll only cost us a train ticket. It's just fun to note that a lot of John Lovitz's line were improvised, and uh, the actresses working around him like really had to bite their lips, literally, uh, to prevent from falling out of character because they had to hold back their laughter. So, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good banter here. Well, I'll say one thing for them: they can run. All of these scenes at various train stations were filmed at the Illinois Railway Museum that had, uh, you know, uh, working, functioning stock uh, of trains uh, that were appropriate for the time period. And man, it just really captures the ambience in a really rich way. A really good choice in regard to scouting locations. Daddy, I'm sorry. Come on, let's go. I can't use her. She's great. Why not? What's the problem? Oh, General Omar Bradley? Yeah. Well, there's too strong a resemblance. From a commercial standpoint of selling the league, uh, certainly the idea of sexual appeal was a factor for the men who were running the show. They wanted their players to look glamorous. Uh, their uniforms, which we'll be introduced to here in a little bit, were certainly a component of all of that. And so, uh, sadly, I have no doubt that conversations and interactions like this very much happened in real life. It's been a thin slice of heaven. Goodbye. Wait, you're going. These scenes were actually shot at Wrigley Field. Um, and despite the fact, you know, there's modern seating in the background, you know, there's some, some modern characteristics to it. Yeah, they tried to spruce it up a little bit um, to bring it back to more so its 1940s appearance. Um, and as you watch these scenes, you notice that the camera pretty much stays at the ground level. And that undoubtedly was used to. Uh, hide the modern intrusions in more modern buildings uh, that had been built in the interim uh, that may have been seen in the background. Something not mentioned in the film is that in the first season of the league, 
uh, one of the all-star games was actually played at this very ballpark uh, at Wrigley Field. Um, and so uh, the storyline definitely did have a connection to this actual place. All these girls gonna be in the league? You wish. You do wish. They're gonna have four teams, 16 girls to a team. That's right, 64 girls. <laughs> you know, they got over 100 girls here, so um, some of you are gonna have to go home. Yes. As was mentioned, there were four teams in the league and they included the Rockford Peaches of Illinois, the Racine Bells from Wisconsin, the Kenosha Comets uh, from Wisconsin, and also the South Bend Blue Sox uh, from Indiana. A lot of well-known actresses auditioned for the various roles in this film, um, but a lot of them were turned away simply because they didn't have any baseball skills. And uh, director Penny Marshall was very insistent, like, you know, this is a film about baseball. You actually have to learn how to play. Um, and so the audition process was also like a tryout process. Can you read, honey? No. All right. What's your name? Shirley Baker. I don't think scenes like this are too much of a theatrical liberty. Uh, you know, in 1940s America, um, in a lot of cases, on average, Americans only had a middle school education. And really, it was the hardship of the Great Depression in the years prior that forced a lot of people out of school. Uh, you had to work, and you had to work in the name of survival. Uh, education was not necessarily a priority. Um, so it's certainly in the realm of the statistical probability um, that some of these individuals couldn't read or write. Certainly could have happened. You all have to get fitted for your uniforms. And this is what they're going to look like. Ready to... You can't slide in that. I like it. Hey, that's a dress. dress. As we can see here, um, these uniforms uh, <laughs> that were most definitely not trousers uh, were rather loathed uh, by the players. Uh, because if you want to slide into a plate, uh, wearing a skirt is not the most practical apparel for it. Uh, but. Uh, such as the world as it was in the 1940s. <laughs> there is no smoking. There is also no drinking and no men. All of your... Just four years prior to this movie, the actor David Strathairn was in another really notable baseball movie. It came out in 1988 called Eight Men Out. And maybe we'll take a look at that film at a future point. Gracefully and grandly. Gracefully and grandly. The players actually did have to endure this glamorized beauty skull uh, to be taught some sort of uh, social etiquette and tact uh, to make them uh, presentable to the public um, in the eyes of their male managers. Um, so suffice it to say, people like Lou Gehrig and Joe DiMaggio uh, didn't have to go to such uh, training schools as such for their public appearances. Lovely. What do you suggest? A lot of night games. Poor Marla. Never judge a book by its cover, though. I never cared for the game myself. And I love grass. And of course, the fortune of cape like this with the mowing and the trimming. The character of Mr. Harvey, uh, played by Gary Marshall in this movie, uh, is pretty much meant to be Philip Wrigley. Uh, who uh, did not own a, a chocolate company, uh, but rather he was the owner and the namesake of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Um, and indeed, you know, he was one of the, the promoters uh, of the female baseball league uh, at this time. And so um, here as well, uh, he is somewhat of a, a composite character in the film, but based off of a real life individual. Um, interestingly enough, uh, these scenes at the Harvey estate uh, were filmed on the estate of Robert McCormick, um, who in the, the interwar era was the owner of the Chicago Tribune. Um, this was located at Cantini Park, uh, located a little bit west of Chicago. And uh, McCormick had been a veteran of the 1st Infantry Division during World War I. And uh, elsewhere on these grounds where this was filmed, uh, you can find the 1st Infantry Division Museum. So another little interesting tidbit there connected to World War II. Look, Jimmy, I want you to manage one of the new girls' baseball teams. Don't 
Don't look so stunned. Thank the inspiration for Tom Hanks' character, likely also a composite, um, but possibly most deeply rooted in the real life persona of a coach by the name of Jimmy Fox, who played for the Philadelphia Athletics, uh, as well as the Red Sox um, from the 1920s through the 1940s, and he eventually became one of the coaches in the league. Tom Hanks has been in a lot of World War II movies, and he's done a lot to help revive interest in the Second World War. And Certainly, we can and should consider A League of Their Own to be one of them. Here it comes, the grand entry. <laughs> There's no historical commentary here, it's just hilarious. <laughs> The initial reaction to the league was not as vindictive or as skeptical as we get a sense of in this particular scene. Um, women's baseball and softball had existed in the Midwest for many, many years prior to all of this. Um, and in fact, I think there was a sense of encouragement uh, that the public at large believed that these women were in fact uh, trying to perform a public service. Uh, and even Franklin Roosevelt said that athletics was an important means of instilling morale in the American people during the war. And regardless of who played it, uh, sports played a really important component in the American home front life. 2-2, two, two, the bottom of the ninth inning with two runners in scoring position and only one out. The specifics of the game in the league were a, a little bit different. It was kind of a hybrid of both baseball and softball. Uh, you know, the dimension of the ball was a little bit different. The feet between the bases was a little bit different, if I recall correctly. Um, you know, there, so there were some differences, but they were permitted to steal home plate, um, which apparently wasn't always the case prior to this. On the home front, they find them everywhere. North, east, south, and west. What we see recreated with this black and white footage is newsreels. And newsreels may be a foreign concept to us today, but they were one of the primary means as to how Americans obtained their news in the 1930s and the 1940s. Before there was television, if you wanted to visualize current events, you had to go to the movie theater, and these newsreels would most frequently be shown uh, between movies. Um, and so I'd almost kind of like to see that brought back, um, have a little bit of civic engagement and uh, information shared uh, when you go to the movie theaters. But uh, it was a different time indeed here uh, before television. He says he's too busy reading the WAN ads and, and um, I should just take him with me and shut up about it. So can I? This question leads to a, a really serious problem uh, that was actually quite prolific in 1940s America because as women were entering the workforce during the war years they had to confront all sorts of challenges that many of them previously hadn't before. Uh, you know there really wasn't any daycare, any sort of you know uh, school programs for kids um, and American women had to figure out what they were going to do with their kids as they were entering the workforce. Um, so it was a very real problem at this time. The song playing in the background here is entitled Flying Home. Uh, it was a very uh, peppy, optimistic song of the war years. Uh, because after all, that's what a lot of service members wanted to do. They wanted to fly home. Um, and so this was a very upbeat tune that captured that air of optimism that many people would hope would be on the horizon as Allied victories progressed. This is some of that 1940s nostalgia that I was talking about near to the beginning of the film. Uh, this you know, time period is synonymous with big band music, swing music, and watching scenes like this, who can't get nostalgic? Really? This is just that liberation that we were talking about a little bit earlier, I think. I can't help but see this showdown as something symbolic 
of struggles that were happening in the workplace all the time during this time period between uh, women who were increasingly finding agency in the workplace and men who had long standing been in power. And I think this is really kind of a tip of the hat uh, to that change that was underway during this era. Are you crying? No. Are you crying? Oh. Are you crying? There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. Why don't you leave her alone, Jimmy? Oh. Lou Gehrig actually proved this otherwise. Uh, if you remember his very tearful farewell where he deemed himself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Um, baseball players on occasion did in fact cry. So if you're in the area, and you must be in the area because this isn't a very powerful radio station, come on down to the ballpark. This wasn't really the case in, in true life. Um, something like well over 100,000 uh, spectators came to these games during the first season. That uh, increased to about a quarter of a million uh, paying visitors uh, during the second season. I um, mean, it only continued to rise uh, into the late 1940s. Um, to, su to suggest that in this early phase that the league was on uh, the brink of failure um, is not entirely accurate, but uh, it certainly works as a thematic device to add a little bit of uh, tension and pressure to the storyline. Oh, trouble with it. She's under it. That was one of the few shots in the movie where a stunt double uh, was used, and uh, for good reason, because to uh, slide into a split uh, takes a little bit of skill. <laughs> Scenes like this where we see wartime propaganda with the three leaders of the Axis powers, Mussolini, Hitler, and Tojo, uh, was very, very common in American society at this time. Uh, there was um, a lot of literature, artwork, uh, things like this as sideshow attractions at baseball games uh, that served as, uh, you know, kind of this uh, mockery of purpose um, against the allied power. So uh, something like that was very frequent. This is a wonderful tip of the hat to the fact that, uh, of course, uh, black women were certainly uh, well qualified and talented enough to be playing baseball, but there was a color line. Uh, there was segregation. Uh, this is several years even before Jackie Robinson uh, broke the color barrier in professional baseball. Um, and really, um, this league never really desegregated. Uh, it was around until the early 1950s, and um, it by and large remained all white. Um, to learn more about segregation and sports during this time, check out our analysis of the movie 42. Blood it up, blood it up. And... A lot of the injuries uh, that we see depicted in the film were real life injuries. Um, including that one with the, the strawberry <laughs> bruise and the, the ice pack that we see here. Um, these were real and they were sustained by the actresses. So, uh, you know, they were really, you know, uh, putting everything into it. That would not be considered an out. You have to catch the ball with your mitt and not your cap. How come you're not in the army? I have no card. In my knee, not that you need cartilage to shoot Nazis. You need this, right? Trigger finger. Studio executives wanted there to be a stronger romantic connection uh, between Dottie and the coach. Um, but the, the director ultimately decided that that just would have been frivolous distraction. Um, and I think that was definitely the right decision, artistically speaking. We told them it was their patriotic duty to get out of the kitchen and go to work. What should we do? Send the boys returning from war back to the kitchen? Do you know how dedicated these girls are? This is really the heart of kind of the, the social dilemma in America uh, after the war. Uh, how was society going to adjust with the restructuring of the national workforce? 
Um, and, you know, not all women went back to the kitchen, so to speak. Um, a large number of them would remain at work, especially in office and clerical duties. Um, and that would only continue to grow in, in the years to come. Uh, but it would be, you know, an upward road, a road that would sometimes be hard traveled. Um, but this conversation really gets to uh, some of the truth and complexity of these issues at that time. The least the army could do is send someone personally until your husband's dead. I'm sorry, Betty. No, John! Seeing the Western Union delivery man was one of the most dreaded scenes that an individual could see on their home street or their place of business in 1940s America because it usually portended something horrific. Uh, often the, the death, injury, or missing in action status of a loved one. Uh, these telegrams were written by the adjutant general's office and they were delivered by Western Union. Uh, they were often delivered weeks after somebody was killed or injured and they were often harshly succinct. Uh, bare bones information without much emotion at all. Um, such telegrams would typically be followed by a letter from a, a commanding officer or a comrade, uh, perhaps explaining some of the details of the final demise uh, of the loved one being talked about within the telegram. Uh, but scenes like this with Betty are just absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, and it really cuts to the chase of the home front experience during the war years because uh, people were always expecting the unexpected. This was a very real fear that was incredibly palpable uh, among the civilian population. And in scenes like this, uh, you know, when you consider all of the, the tens of thousands of American women who became widows during the war, um, it really speaks to one of the big strengths of this movie. Um, a good comedy knows how to balance funny content with serious content. And in that regard, A League of Their Own succeeds in a really big way. I miss you so much. I've been discharged. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. This is a fine example in the film where you can tell that the people behind the scenes were really doing their homework. In an earlier conversation between Dottie and Jimmy, uh, she mentioned that her husband Bob was in Italy somewhere. And indeed, the, the division patch that we can see on Bob's uh, sleeve uh, denotes the 36th Infantry Division. Uh, and indeed, that was an outfit that was fighting in Italy during this point in the war. Um, and so it's a nice little detail that most audience members uh, wouldn't recognize, um, but it just speaks once again to the, the strength of uh, the material culture aspect of the film and also uh, the wardrobe. Uh, it's really top notch. Yeah. Wow, avoid the clap, Jimmy Dugan. Wow. The, the phrase, the clap, uh, AKA gonorrhea, uh, was a phrase that uh, gained a lot more use during the World War II years uh, because it was uh, a more frequent than cared to be admitted symptom of many soldiers and servicemen who were uh, really away from home for the first time. Um, and so uh, uh, that was a phrase that was widely being used at this time and perhaps even those uh, little kids had an idea of what Jimmy Dugan was talking about. Bob and I are driving home. Oregon. Driving home to Oregon in your own automobile at the height of World War II would not have been possible. Uh, you'll notice in one of the scenes that there is an A sticker on the car, the letter A. That signifies that the operator of that vehicle was confined to four gallons of gas per month. <laughs> so, where this couple was going to get their gasoline after they ran out of the four gallons to drive back to Oregon, I know not. So this is a very subtle, slight, uh, historical flaw uh, with that conversation. Gasoline was rationed. People could not drive 
really beyond the confines of their neighborhood. Um, taking the train would have been a far more likely scenario uh, had Bob and Dottie actually decided to go back to Oregon. You'll also notice that Bob and Dottie's collar is uh, a 1920s Model T. And you think, well, that's the wrong time period. Well, not necessarily, um, because many people could not afford to buy new cars throughout the 1930s as the Great Depression was underway. And at the end of 1941, car manufacturing, civilian automobile manufacturing in the United States ceased. And it would not really resume until 1946. Um, only military vehicles were being produced in the United States. So seeing a car from the 20s in the 1940s was not at all uncommon. Um, and so that's actually a nice little detail that's included here. I just love the look of the ballpark. Uh, the billboards, uh, the, the manual scoreboard, uh, the posters. It's perfect. I love it. Tom Hanks gained something like 30 pounds for this role. He just kept eating Dairy Queen um, because uh, Penny Marshall wanted him to look older and just really out of shape in comparison to your average baseball player. <laughs> I understand that these scenes were filmed when it was uh, over 100 degrees outside. Uh, this was filmed at a, an old time ballpark in Indiana. And uh, you know, you could only imagine how sweltering it was for all of these uh, extras and ball players wearing uh, wool clothing, multiple layers of uh, vintage apparel. Um, but true to form, uh, you know, all of the service members in the crowd, you know, uh, the, the soldiers, are wearing their khaki uniforms. Uh, the sailors are wearing their whites. Um, and so, you know, there again, uh, another fine example of uh, somebody in the production department doing their homework, historically speaking. Part of Hans Zimmer's score that really excels in this movie is that he truly and effectively incorporates a lot of uh, the big band and cinematic sounds that you would find in 1940s movies. And here too, this might be something that not a lot of audience members might recognize, um, but if you listen to enough 1940s music and you watch as many 1940 movies as I have, um, you can pick up these subtleties throughout the film. I miss you, Ken. Me? Yeah, how many sisters do you think I have? It's really an underdog story within an underdog story when you think about it. Hi, I'm a big fan of yours. Hi, yeah. I'm Dottie says. Oh, hey, hey. Tom Hanks and Bill Pullman also vie for the same woman in Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> this emotional finale of the film, I think, speaks to just the really pivotal role of, of family during the war years. Um, now naturally, but most of us, I would assume, uh, value our families. Um, but this sensation was really heightened in the 1940s because so many families were broken up and separated. Um, and, you know, and I think that's something that we should definitely keep in mind and take into account. Dottie? The casting of the older counterparts of these characters is just so perfect. They, they look like their younger selves. They have the same mannerisms. Just wonderful casting. The League came to an end around 1953, 1954, and some of these final conversations that we see in the film uh, certainly a hint at the real life story is these women went on, they went on to other professions, they started families. Uh, professional baseball for them became a thing of the past, but it was absolutely fundamental to how they saw themselves and what their identity was. It was a foundation. Not the ones you use or need an 
As we see these scenes inside the museum, I'm reminded of a really wonderful exhibit that I saw at a South Bend, Indiana History Museum uh, that was dedicated to uh, this women's league. Uh, and it just did such a, a fantastic job uh, integrating artifacts into the, the broader story of their, their multiple seasons throughout the 1940s and the 1950s. And uh, it, it, it really uh, gave a lot of important context as to how these women were really pioneers of society at that time. Uh, they broke a barrier not only for women in sports, but also women in society as a whole. If I were Tom Hanks, I would have this fake museum panel hanging in my house. <laughs> At its heart, a, a league of their own is uh, in many ways a, a feminist movie that has this rather rich historical backdrop to it. And I think it's a, a valuable insight into 1940s America. And another thing that makes it a really wonderful film is, you know, it's rated PG. Uh, it's suitable for classroom use. Uh, it's accessible to young people. And in my mind, it's one of the absolute best films that shows how American society was operating during the World War II years. Uh, from a central perspective, it is a baseball film, but it's also much more than that. It offers us this rich perspective into this bygone era, and it introduces us to characters to which we can uh, relate to and be inspired by. And uh, of course, uh, these sorts of uh, stories and lessons are universal and always rather endearing. So, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Real History. We hope you enjoyed some of the insights on A League of Their Own. We'll see you next time on Real History.